at it.
Hello. Yes, I think this works. Good evening. Welcome back in Amsterdam. It's seven o'clock here. It's a beautiful evening, as you can see. And we're ready for day three of Dev Days. And now you're lucky with the virtual Dev Days because normally this would be the last day, but we have four. So this is day three. Well, long before we had virtual backgrounds and depended on them, we had real backgrounds. So here's mine. You'll see the apartments next doors. The gardens are downstairs here. And this is my outside. Here's where I receive my friends, have barbecues, uh, spend some time with the flowers. Uh, it's been a really good day and I needed that a bit to get some fresh air because yesterday's pub was uh, actually more real than virtual, I must say. Let's get back inside. Hold on a second. Uh, yeah, there we are. Back inside. And you know, I found out that I can make this actually quite a lot more confusing by doing this. See, I'm back outside again. Well, this works too. So um, let's get started with the presentation, shall we? And uh, let's kick day three of sharing my presentation more or less now. Okay, here we are. So um, day three, my name is Ewart Kramer, CTO of Firely. And uh, we are the organizers together with HL7 of the Fire Dev Days. So yesterday was our virtual pub crawl and it was way more fun than I expected, I must say. Um, I'll show you here, look at that. I have some, some pictures at least from yesterday. This was our office uh, for somewhat more bar feeling. We actually went to the Firely office, had cheese, had bitter balls, had uh, you know, drinks, uh, beer a little bit too much. And it was actually, well, guys who kept on going on after Amsterdam and Toronto closed, I roved the streets and I found that the DC uh, virtual pub was still open. And uh, it was so nice there that this, this is a picture I took this morning. It's been a long time ago that I did that. This is morning light, 4.32 a.m. Amsterdam time. So I was happy that I could sleep a little bit this morning, um, a little bit longer, I slept in a bit, but this was so beautiful. I keep on saying to myself, I should do this more, get up early and enjoy the fresh morning light. Well, I know I won't, but that's always a good plan. Thanks, thanks for having me. And um, I, I think we all enjoyed ourselves a lot yesterday, the virtual pop crawl. Good, the program um, is a lot like yesterday's program in the sense that the first 50 minutes, it's just uh, going to be uh, this single channel so you can stay on. Um, after I will actually introduce um, Sarah who comes after me. And after that, we'll go to the, uh, the pitches for the patient innovator track. Uh, we're a bit familiar with that by now. We've seen it before. And then at about, well, you know, I'm not gonna promise you we'll be on time, but about two o'clock uh, Eastern, we'll be ready and start the meetings for today. They really look the same like yesterday, not much changed. So it's another you know, list of sessions of 40 minutes with parallel um, sessions. This time again, the uh, community track starts at 2.45. And uh, there is something new though today. So I have a slide for you about that. That is the startup track. If you look at the agenda, there is a 14 minute block dedicated to the startup track. And um, you'll see pitches for, uh, for a few startups. You'll see the, the headshots here of the founders. They'll, they'll be pitching their company and their product. And they won't do this for nothing. No, there's five pitches, uh, pitches and there'll be judges um, and a public vote to determine the winner. And uh, the winner will receive two and a half thousand dollars in prize money provided by our sponsors, One Up Health and Health Samurai. Uh, you won't see today who's winning, actually. We'll do that tomorrow. The award ceremony is tomorrow during the opening plenary. So you'll have to wait a little bit to see who won the uh, startup track. So that's today. Today are the pitches tomorrow during the award ceremony, um, as the award ceremony will during the opening plenary. Also, again, like yesterday, I don't know if you participated, I did, uh, in the uh, 
yoga session, just, you know, sit anywhere you like and enjoy. This is an image uh, from yesterday. You can see a really peaceful office there and our yoga instructor. Um, that's at 3.30 to 4.10. So if you didn't join yesterday and you feel like it, there is enough space. Normally, you know, we're, we're that's the thing is a virtual. Normally you have to fight for a place with, uh, with our massages or for the yoga, but now we got capacity enough. Um, as usual, again, like the previous two days, there will be a wrap up, uh, though Wayne won't be opening the pub crawl tonight anymore. Uh, we'll give you back to your dear ones. You can simply pick up your child or uh, start cooking afterwards on um, actually keep on your mic and your headphone on because of course that's after this, the real, um, well, hey, that's it, that's the end of the day then. Yeah, no, you'll have to wait until day four, but that's, that's for another day. Uh, so Wayne will do the wrap up at five, about 10 minutes, and we'll give you back your day after that. Yesterday, we talked about technical problems uh, because the day before yesterday, day one, we had a few problems with the joining fail. We heard nothing of the sort. Now, I've been in software long enough that I know that it can mean a few things. Either you all have given up and you, you don't complain about it, um, or it's still in work, but you, you, know, you know your way around now, or it actually worked. Uh, so assuming the last is true, then we should give kudos to the Hoover guys who probably then worked the whole night fixing the problems we had on the first day. So kudos for them if, um, if what we're seeing is, um, is indeed true. Lots of questions in the social channels about, can we get recordings? Yes, you can. The previous day's recordings are available as far as we have them and as far as we are allowed to put them online by just going to yesterday's agenda and yesterday's session and you see this button, watch recording. So you can uh, view um, these recordings. Better still, they'll remain online for a uh, I think about a year. So, you know, you can go back in uh, even after death days, even after you've returned home and uh, view the uh, recordings, uh, re for, uh, the recorded sessions. So the slides will take a bit more time. Uh, you know how that goes. Most of the presenters normally prepare their slides while flying intercontinental uh, and then drop the by. Now, well, now uh, you know, they still do it on the last moment and, um, we are collecting them, but as usual, it takes a bit of time. So you will get the slides. We'll post them. Um, we'll post them uh, probably somewhere in the agenda as well. For those who are new today, maybe still important in the app, if you're stuck, uh, there is the ask the organizers anything. So if you still have technical problems, uh, you can you can ask us there. Uh, pl please report it's also of interest to the WUVA people uh, if there are still any uh, problems. All this is new, uh, not only for us, but also for them. So uh, if you find things still not working, please report it so we can report back to WUVA as well. Um, and general questions about what do I need to do next? Of course, welcome as well there. Just like yesterday, I would like to thank our event sponsors uh, as visible here. Um, who make it possible that we could bring these four days of education, educational event to you. So um, here they are. And that brings me to my last slide. Um, and that means that I can introduce to you uh, Sarah Novotny. Uh, Sarah has long been an open source uh, champion in projects such as Kubernetes, Nginx and MySQL. Uh, she's currently part of the Microsoft Azure office of the CTO. I hope she's going to tell us a little bit about what that means as well. Uh, she sits on the Linux Foundation Board of Directors and she led before the open source strategy group at Google. Further, she run a large scale technology infrastructures, um, actually before we call it large scale web scale uh, technology. Of interest to us as well is that she is passionate about building communities and empowering people around her through mentorship, sponsorship and listening. So without further ado, um, I'd like to give the word to Sarah. Thank you so much. I am going to share my screen and get us started that way. We have a screen from me, we're good. All right, 
I am Sarah Navani, and uh, I can absolutely talk a little bit about the Azure Office of the CTO, but it's a nice collection of people who take a uh, broad view and a long-term view about work that is happening inside Microsoft. So um, it is a very broad view across all of Microsoft, uh, not just Azure, but also then a uh, long-term view, meaning many of our initiatives are multi-year initiatives in order to get uh, work done, whereas many of the product teams are, are more shorter term focused. So that's what our work does. And of course, open source community is one of those things that no matter how uh, much effort you put into it, you don't see immediate results. You end up needing to uh, build that community over time and build it in a way that allows it to continue to scale and grow without you. So this is my talk on lessons for 2020. So I had started a whole different talk last fall for this event and realized as I was getting coming back to it and getting ready and preparing this morning, or not this morning, this week, um, I wasn't quite that late with my slides. As I was preparing this week, I realized that I really instead wanted to speak to lessons that we've learned in the open source source community that we can take to the very, very complicated world that we have today. So um, I want to first make a note that it is super important for technologists to remember that tech comes and goes. And for anyone who's been in tech 15 or 20 or 25 years, you can almost always draw parallels to previous technologies. But in fact, the, the soft skills the skills that people uh, used to refer to as soft are now much more importantly used in collabor collaboration across uh, boundaries within your own companies, across organizations, and across the industry when we're talking about, broadly speaking, open source. So that's what I'm going to look at. And then I'm going to look at how this all applies to the globe and how we can take some of these lessons that we've learned in open source and move them to the broader issues, both for your projects today and also anything that you're wanting to make change in the world about. So our world has changed dramatically in the last in the last three months, in the last six months. And many of us are uh, expected to be in uh, Cleveland this week. And many of us have traveled, do a lot of travel in order to do our work, but that's really no longer available to us. So we've moved to a world that is very much more uh, remote or distant and uh, where possible in many countries, people are working from home and for extended periods of time. And the nice thing about open source in this case is because we have always worked across different companies, across the whole industry, remote work, whether it happened to be from home in that case or from my office versus your office, was our standard. So we were very familiar with that and there will be some lessons that we can take away from that. We also are in a space where at this point, at least in the US and more broadly across the world, we're really paying attention to systemic injustices that are built into the world. So everybody's had a very, very complicated first half of the year. And, uh, and we want to make sure that we can offer you the help and guidance that can be distilled out of open source community building. So let me talk about a few topics from that. Um, one of the things that we talk about and I find super important in open source and actually usually is very much helped by a project being open sourced is seeking new perspectives. So this is not getting trapped in your own perspective uh, from only your company view or only your customer's view. It is important to make sure that you are building something that fits a need and then beyond that, if it's possible, building something that can be used in new and exciting and even different ways, especially if you're working in infrastructure or standards or specifications, much like, like FHIR is, making sure that you have the broadest possible view on how people will want to actually use this, both the developers that are building tooling for it and then the end users who actually are making sure that uh, the tools we build are useful to them. 
Now, of course, seeking new perspectives is also super important in a more broad learning culture and in the world today to try to understand and relate to and engage with people who you don't necessarily interact with uh, on a day to day basis, but certainly could. We spend a lot of time also in open source learning and growing and also teaching because it's super important. I mentioned in the beginning that you are building communities and a world around you that is sustainable without your direct engagement, without you having to be a bottleneck for anything or for everything, even worse. That means that as a leader in any sort of open source community, it is part of your responsibility to make your job redundant or to prepare other leaders who come in to your project in order to work uh, work and lead as you may move off to another project or move on to do different work. This also very, very broadly speaks to how we need to be bringing our values and our vision for the world back to every generation behind us and across and broadly to different uh, to different communities where we may not have uh, ex had experience before. And part of learning and growing, of course, is listening. And that is something that I will spend some more time on later. Teaching is important as well, but right now I think we're in a spot where listening and understanding is very important. Measure what matters. One of the things that I find in open source projects that is often uh, touted as a way to see how successful a project is, is GitHub stars. And I don't think anyone has ever built a project that uh, then turned the GitHub stars into something that was useful or a way that you could even identify what that meant. To me, GitHub stars never matter. They're sort of a weak signal about maybe who might be vaguely interested in whatever you titled your repository as, but they're not super interesting. I think what's much more interesting is engagement with new um, project members or new committers to your project, new community members who might be interested in just sort of lurking within your project. And then the, the longitudinal look at that, as in if I had a new committer today and that person was engaged with the project in a meaningful way, did they, uh, did the project engage with them? Did they end up staying for three months and make multiple commits or multiple um, issues raised? Or did they make one issue, have a bad experience, and then move away from that project? So finding what is important and what matters is the best way to make change in a project or in a world. You need to measure the things that are important and then try very hard to change those measurements in a positive direction. Open source is also an opportunity uh, to build different skills as well as seeking out different skills for your project. So one of the things that I find with uh, people who join an open source project who may not be being paid to participate in that project those people are often coming to a project for a space where they can grow, where they can sort of expand. Maybe it's a new, uh, maybe it's a new protocol, or maybe it's a new um, way to perceive infrastructure, or a new tool set that might be being evaluated for use with their company. But often they're coming to a project to look for something a little bit new and a little bit different. And that difference, the perspectives that they bring while they're coming to learn from you, makes for a stronger team. So respect those differences and, and work to build a team that has very, very broad skills. And that's a virtual team in the open source project. It's also true for your corporate teams. But in this case, the open source teams um, struggle a little bit differently with that in part because there is, the, uh, there is an unbalanced offer of free time in the world in the way that some people have more free time or more ability to work in an open source project as a part-time job as opposed to a full-time job. So there's different levels of access for that, but that just means that 
as a human interacting with the world, you need to be sure to be reaching out to engage with people that are uh, different and have different skills from what you're, you are used to and learning from that. Which of course means that you have to spend an inordinate amount of time listening and understanding and trying to understand the perspective that the person is coming from, understand what your perspective is, and then make a decision as to whether or not your perspective needs to change or the, the roadmap for the project might need to change, having listened to customer requests or a industry peer or competitor even offering feedback into your open source project. This listening is critical in both the success of the project and also the success of the human relationships because people are messy and our projects are built with people. It is a whole pile of code that goes out and does something, but under the covers, it's a bunch of people that have built that code, argued about the right features to put into it, engaged with the, the world and the, the needs of their customers and tried to come to a solution that would best fit those requirements. So in this listening, there's a couple of components. One is, of course, the technical side. The human side it requires empathizing. And this new, mostly remote, far less uh, direct connected world, empathy is even more important. When you're sitting on a video call or you are reading an email, you have no idea what has happened in that day to the person that you are engaging with unless they've chosen to share with you. So my, my joke on this slide uh, was that I was going to say walk, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes, but I'm presuming that most of us aren't wearing shoes because we're connected from home and we are trying to do much more remote work. So instead, we're just going to empathize and recognize that We've all had emails that show up that just, you know, light your hair on fire because you had a bad day. I had a bad day. Um, maybe it was the writer that had the bad day. Maybe it was the reader who is now seeing what has happened and is leading to this big question of what in the world was the intention of that email or what in the world was the intention of that comment? Was it a neutral? comment? Was it something that was passive aggressive and grumpy? Was it something that I'm just misinterpreting and was actually just a throwaway comment from the person who wrote it? Text is terrible for conveying uh, tone and emotion. And so we bring so much more of that to every email read or every uh, comment on a code review that it's important to remember where is my head right now as I'm reading this? And then being empathetic that first off, if my head was in an okay space and it still really comes off as passive aggressive, it may have been a really, really bad day for the person who write it, wrote it. Or it may have just been dashed off in haste trying to get information back to you. So please give the benefit of the doubt when it, it comes to uh, text interactions, especially uh, in a world where we are under even greater stress, generically underlying stress with the concerns around the COVID pandemic, with the concerns about uh, in the US about systemic racism and in you know, more globally, the, the challenges with uh, Hong Kong protests and, and generally the world today is very complicated. So making sure to take a step back and understanding that while someone may have written something to you that is uh, getting your hackles up, it may not have been intentional anyway, and you ultimately are the one who is responsible for the feelings that happen. Another piece of lore within open source is the concept of chopping wood and carrying water. And this is doing the work that is unglamorous. This is the work that needs to happen in every project and in every community, whether that's a software community or a protest community. 
this is the work that is generally under uh, praised and is the work that the project or, or community would fall apart without. Within Kubernetes, we actually have a chop wood and carry water award that is given out every year to a member of the community who does this unglamorous work and does it without complaint and to great effect. And it is super, super important to make sure that you are both volunteering in this way, engaging in this way, and acting as a community member who is active and uh, not setting yourself uh, aside as potentially privileged, but also doing some of the less glamorous work. Which leads me to rewarding the behaviors you want to encourage. This is super, super important in the world today and in projects. Within the world today, we have to make a space for positive responses to hard conversations. If you want to have hard conversations about architecture in, in the project that you're working on, if you want to have hard conversations in your company about uh, injustice, or if you want to have hard conversations with your family about the risks with the pandemic today, all of these are hard for people to engage with and there needs to be a reward and maybe that's a, a quick dopamine thank you and you're welcome reward or maybe it's something more profound like the chop wood carry water award but you have to reward the behaviors you want to encourage um, my partner has two teens and i get to be a step parent for them and we spend a lot of time talking about and being explicit about rewarding behaviors that we want to encourage. And we talk with them about this as well. So in this rewarding behaviors you want to encourage in a world where we are increasingly going to be checked and managed and tracked for data that is important and, and helpful to our pandemic health, for example, with contact tracing, we need to make sure that our technologies are working within the bounds of good ethical constraints, good ethical frameworks, and that even as within open source communities, we try to be open and transparent about what we are working on, how we're working on it. We know in open source communities that there still needs to be private space. There still needs to be a respect for that one-to-one uh, -one conversation and that that can be shared uh, with more context that doesn't necessarily need to be part of the uh, greater project. So making sure as we're building tools that we're respecting privacy, making things as open as uh, they can be and as uh, private and protected as is necessary is incredibly important. This privacy, in a lot of cases, um, is a way that we can show respect and show dignity in the world and ultimately lead to a spot where more people are finding this a positive world and a positive experience, whether it's your open source project or the community that you live in or your family, and fewer of them are potentially choosing the sad face. I hope that these thoughts, having come from the open source community, help you as you move through the world and as you uh, develop more open source projects using FIRE. Thank you. Unmuted. Well, thank you. I um. I enjoyed it quite a lot, actually. Thanks for that. Um, and um, unfortunately, we we don't have the interactivity now to post questions. So, um, but there is the Q and A session, the Q and A questions, and I encourage everyone to post the questions there. The good thing about that is that uh, 
those who are not here with us this morning can see the answers as well. So there is an advantage to every disadvantage. So please take, uh, take advantage of the technical possibilities that we do have. So with that said, um, I'd like to introduce for the third time in a row, um, our own e-patient, Dave, uh, David Bronkhardt, who, there he is again. It's not, is it Boston again? Yeah. Who will, um, will this time around show us uh, um, actually uh, two pitches. So um, I guess he will need all the time that we can give him. So I'll hand it over to Dave. Thank you. I'd like to thank Sarah also. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world today and uh, I got some really useful thoughts from that. So with no further ado, share screen. Um, I got to say, I'm thrilled with how this whole thing is working out for us uh, this year. There's a tremendous discussion in the patient empowerment stream on Zulip. So here we are, uh, day three. This is me. For those who weren't here yesterday, this is me on the my deck in the backyard with my MITRE Corp Own Your Health Data shirt on. This is it. Uh, so let's see. Reminder, later today, you will get the, an email for a poll for the People's Choice Award. This is separate from what your judges, what the judges are doing. We will award the cash prize uh, tomorrow, but this is purely which ones did you like? Uh, you can, to review, go back to each patient video and watch them. They are in their time slot in the agenda in Whova if you want to review them. Uh, to bring this track to a close, because you'll hear our final two finalists in the next half hour, uh, I want to remind you of what empowerment is. This is the definition of empowerment I introduced on Monday. It's the World Bank has been using for more than 15 years. It's increasing people's capacity to make choices and take effective action. And we cannot do that without data. We perform better when we're informed better. You can't keep us in the dark and then patients don't know anything. But there's a flip side that I'm gonna introduce now, the law of patient empowerment. The doctors can perform better when they're informed better as well please list to what informed patients have to contribute. Get it into the record. I want to take a moment also to let you know that in case you haven't heard, last summer, uh, HL7 approved the creation of a patient empowerment work group. And the co-chairs on the right are Debbie Willis for G. Lorenzi and meet at Thursday on uh, 1 p.m., not this week. We have, uh, you can search for us on Confluence stream. And it's wonderful to me that our, uh, that what these presentations are about this week in the patient track line up with the initial priority and in project leads. You can find all, again, on Confluence page. Directions to enter in the record. Very common problem. Patient contributed data. We made a point of not patient generated data. This is patient contributed data. And in your first presentation today, in a moment, you will see an example of things that a patient wants in the record because she keeps having to explain it to everybody. And then care planning and consents. So here we are now. Uh, let me introduce Bray Patrick Lake. She just to title her talk, I'm at her right to the void because she's a highly accomplished person and even co chair of the Precision Medicine Initiative and being a researcher, she can't pull together all the data that her doctors need to treat her complex conditions. I'll be in a few minutes uh, for a question for her after her video and then our fourth finalist.
Good afternoon, everybody. I am Bray Patrick Lake, and I am thrilled to be here at Dev Days with you as a patient innovator. Uh, the title of my talk is I'm entering to shine a light on the void. And honestly, I think I am a little more of a patient paper pusher than a patient innovator. I think a lot of uh, the cool kids and early adopters come and talk to you about the great things they've been able to do with their health data, and I am totally not that person. In fact, I have been able to do uh, nothing with it. So I have managed to collect my health data and compile it into some completely worthless notebooks of PDFs and disks. I've participated in things like the Get My Health uh, Data Challenge and done some other activities um, for patients trying to make something useful of their medical record, and so far, I've got nothing, but I really need your help. So I'm kind of one of those patients that I look completely normal, but I've had some really weird health events where I've become paralyzed and unable to speak out of the blue. Um, I've had horrible migraines. I've had some really rare adverse events um, happen with medications that are very common. Um, I've had a lot of procedural related complications. I've had post-op bleeds. And I also have a lot of implanted uh, medical devices, which again, you look at me and I look totally normal. And so I'm extremely challenged to aggregate all this information and tell a very complex health story very rapidly. So the first thing that I really need your help with is creating a record that is useful in emergencies. And I know somebody out there is going to think, well, there's some great apps that do that, but I have implanted medical devices and those are nowhere um, in those apps. And even in my EHR, I definitely suffer from hyperportalosis where I've got multiple patient portals across multiple health systems. And depending on which door I go in, some of the providers may not have access to that information. In fact, the majority of them, which is very scary. I was recently in a car accident and actually refused to go um, to the hospital because it wouldn't have been the hospital that had my medical records. Um, I have gone so far as to even create these cute little snapshots of where devices are implanted um, in my body and who implanted them. But I didn't happen to have that on me the night that I was in an accident. I was also so out of it that I'm not sure I could have produced it. But What's really important is that a lot of these devices um, have specific requirements for uh, imaging, such as MRI. And so you need to know what the Tesla rating is, um, if they're able to withstand um, that uh, type of scan. And so if I'm not able to communicate for myself, I need this information to be readily available. So what's the device? Where is it located in my body? Who made it? What's the date of implantation? certainly any imaging guidelines um, for the device. And then it would be terrific to even have pipelines built to these images, whether they're stored in a cloud or you know, being accessed through a health system. It's really key that I get access and my providers get access to this information um, urgently, particularly in an emergency. The next thing I really need you to do is create a longitudinal visualization of health. So the closest thing I've seen was created by the brilliant Katie McCurdy at Pictal Health. Uh, somebody should call her, see if she wants to collaborate. She was hand illustrating uh, her own patient stories and now does that for others. But I've got this story that now dates back, um, you know, almost 20 years and appointments are 15 minutes. And so trying to jump into an appointment and say, this is what happened, you know, back in 2004 and then bring people up to speed very rapidly. I need to really be able to visualize um, in what I would call almost a visual Richter scale of when an event occurred, how serious it was, um, what was the symptom burden, you know, and what, what was the magnitude of impact on my life. And so somehow I think we need to pull these things in and have it be, um, you know, a, a tech export of, of some kind that basically looks similar to what a visual resume is. So I could go into a visual resume software and enter, you know, my education and the history of my employment and my commitments. And you could see professionally the years that I was really, um, prolific in publication or activity. So why can't we do that for basically my health events and my, my symptom burden? That would be brilliant to just be able to, you know, dial back year to year and, and show kind of the, the ebb and the flow of what's happened in my life. The third thing I'm gonna ask you to do is, is help me accurately capture medication use. So our traditional data capture right now really looks at when a provider prescribed a medication, um, or when a medication was filled, if we're looking at claims data, but it doesn't say anything about how and when I started taking it, what happened when I took it. If I'm not taking it, why is that? Is it that I couldn't get it, or is it that I had unpleasant side effects, or that I had some type of serious adverse event? 
um, it's really, really important that we know when patients started these medications and if they're even accurately using uh, the types of medications. So I'll give you just one, one example. I started a medication after heart surgery. Um, it was Plavix, so an antiplatelet medication. It happened to disagree with me. And unfortunately, I had joint pain and nausea, and I became extremely ill, uh, vomiting. I had petechia. My blood vessels were rupturing. And I ended up in the emergency room, which, of course, um, being a woman in her 40s, uh, actually, I was in my 30s at the time, they said, you know, the differential diagnosis was anxiety, which is incredibly frustrating. They said I was just anxious because I'd recently had heart surgery. Well, thank goodness they did a blood test. My liver enzymes, um, my ALT was actually 33 times what my normal would have been. Um, I was discharged uh, with not a lot of information, but my primary care physician said, please stop taking that medication and let's see what happened. And so within a week, my liver enzymes returned to normal. But if you look at my health history and you just look at these labs, that's not contextualized in any way. You have no idea that I was actually taking a new medication and that this is what happened. And then when I stopped the medication, um, my uh, labs returned to normal. So that is crucial that we start to really start uh, giving the patients the opportunity to work with their providers and contextualize this information in some way. And then, of course, I would like to pull that into my master record so that it doesn't only just say, you know, I have an allergy to this medication. It can show what actually happened. The next thing I want to recommend is that we really start to layer our electronic health records and medication information with person-generated health data. So I think we all know that through uh, smartphones, sensors, wearables, we're all generating this data that's passive and continuously being generated and, and can be collected to really take what's currently invisible in our health and make that more visible. So right now, credit to Evidation Health on, um, on this visible invisible graphic, we're basically right now, we're just capturing these episodic snapshots that in no way tell the whole patient story. Um, I found this great um, post in a public Facebook group, actually it's a Facebook page, uh, Millions Missing Voice Global, that told the story of this young woman who says, you know, here's what you see. I look normal, healthy, and she's beautiful. And then everything around her, fatigue, brain fog, tachycardia, migraines, flare-ups, uh, medication, insomnia, all these things that are floating around her head, like that is my experience when I had an exacerbation of health. Not only would I have migraines, I'd have dysautonomia, which is the most frustrating thing to try to capture and explain. I had tachycardia. You can guess that if I went into my cardiology office and did, you know, my EKG in the office, it never caught anything. But yet through devices, we now can actually capture that you know, in real life, in real time. And so this type of information has got to be layered in with all these other things. And then it's gotta be contextualized and we will start to have these representations of what uh, is known as the behavior gram. So you can start to see you know, what a patient's true burden of illness and experience living with a disease is on a daily basis. Um, if you looked at my sleep, you know, that is, would be super telling and it has a huge impact on my quality of life. Um, and again, it's something very frustrating to try to treat or explain, but now we've got devices and we can actually record this information, but I want to layer it with what my medical experiences are and certainly with any new medications that I'm starting and stopping. And lastly, I'll just leave you with this, that person-generated health data is extremely personal and sensitive, and we really have to ensure that there are appropriate protections and mechanisms in place where patients can permission that data flow. So if we want it to go into a clinical encounter, you know, that's, that's our business, and we should be able to prove that. If we want it to be integrated into our EHR, we should be able to have that control and permissioning. And certainly we should be able to decide if we'd like to share our data for research. So please, please, please just make sure that whatever you come up with that helps me achieve these goals, that patients' data never ever leaves without their knowledge or in the dark of night. So this has been just a really brief overview. I know that we only had 10 minutes to power through, but I just wanna say thank you. Please use technology to help me create a useful snapshot of my health that captures the critical medical device information and pipelines to imaging longitudinal pictures and visual Richter scales of health events and exacerbations. Please capture how and when we're using medication. And if we're not, why not? Layer in the passively and continuously collected person generated health data that has now been contextualized. We have great opportunity to ask patients and push out EPROs or surveys and have patients actually you know, verify or, um, or contextualize what's going on in real time. And so all of this should become part of this longitudinal record that I so desperately seek. And 
always, always ensure that protections are in place for patients to control the flow of their own health information. Thank you. Oh, Bray, are you here? It's great to see you. Terrific presentation. I, it's, it, it, it's hard to believe, given the difficulty and challenges and mess that you described, that you're right side up and functioning. You know, there's, as you said, you look healthy, but there's all this stuff going on. Uh, a question from the judges, and your, your video really stimulate a lot of different thoughts, so I tried to distill several questions down uh, into one. How much of all the things you just talked about needs to get into the EHR, which may be a massive project, or should it be in an app? And how much of all that would make you comfortable accepting an ambulance ride from strangers after a car accident? Uh, I definitely think an app would be more useful and something that I could, you know, easily access off of my smartphone. And, and I have this, um, so I'm telling my age, but even back with like the old iPod when we used to scroll through and I could dial back to a certain year and maybe expand and say, you know, this is the, the year where you can see I had a lot of spikes. This is when I had, you know, this surgery, this procedure, this adverse event. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I know a lot of people work hard on EHRs and I still remain to be completely frustrated by them. So anything you can do to free the data would be helpful to me. Well, what's clear to me uh, is that EHRs, as we know, especially in the US, which I guess is the source of a lot of EHRs, uh, were designed around transactions and counters, those like spikes sure. that you showed in one of those graphs yep. uh, with no intent at all of presenting the patient's whole picture. Yeah, totally. It doesn't tell the story accurately, and it's it's not useful. So I, uh, I agree. so I I hope that that'll be one one outcome of this track. So thank you very much. Uh, good luck in in the voting. And uh, now I'll transition back over to sharing my screen to introduce our fourth finalist. Take thank care. You. So our fourth finalist uh, is, and I'm very pleased that we have uh, applicants from outside the US this time. Hamza Salem uh, lives in Annapolis in Russia, which is a relatively new city the, that was created as an innovation center. It's a combination of the word innovation and the Greek polis for city. Uh, and uh, he will share the story of how, out of the personal need of his family, uh, he has created a diabetes data tracker and converted it into a prototype app. Those of you who saw our competition last fall in Amsterdam will recognize that what he did has something in common with what last year's winner did, John Keyes, in creating an app for himself. The, they're both developers. Uh, to track data that's important to them. And with that, we'll hand it over to Hamza's video, and then we'll be back with final questions. This presentation for my mother's soul and all diabetes patients in the world. Hello, everyone. My name is Hamza Salem, and today I will present you Fire Diabetes app a diabetes tracker into a prototype application. The problem for diabetes patient is the tracking method. We have two tracking method. We have paper logbook and we have the e-logbook. The paper logbook is a regular logbook that you will save or write your dosing day by day on that logbook. In the e-logbook, it's kind of web application or a mobile application that can be exist on private institution patients. The first method have a problem with the backup. There is no backup. If you lose that logbook, you will lose a part of your history as a patient. And the other problem with the e-logbook, there is no integration between another institution. Everyone have his own system. If the patient left an institu in institution, he will leave his history there. And because of that, I created Fire Diabetes application. It's a mobile application I created for Android and iOS. This application is specialized to, to track glucose dosing. 
for patients from type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Fire Diabetes app is like any tracking application, providing the regular way to track information for the patient, such as profile or daily dosing. This application providing a simple view with a graph can be customized and you can filter information by time and date range and categories. The application is free and secure. However, the main point for this application is this line or this button. We have a button called export to fire. The main idea is making it flexible to migrate to any fire page system. For example, when you click in export, you will export the data in a JSON format based on fire resources standard. So this file can be integrated with any fire based system in the world. This feature giving the patient the authority to use his own data by himself. And as, as you know, this file written on fire format, this file can be easy integrate to any medical institution that working with fire. So today, if you're saving your daily dosing on diabetes app tracker or fire diabetes app tracker, your history will be yours. Your data is yours and you can integrate it with whatever system based on fire. My motivation as a person, my mother, God bless her, she passed away this January and she had diabetes. And as a family, we have tracked her dosing every day. And I know how critical for people who, who had diabetes and they have patients diabetes in their houses. So I, I have decided to create a diabetes application for all the diabetes patients in the world. One of the main point for me is creating something that people will use and people will get benefit from the data itself. So this is will lead me for my motivation as a developer. Because I'm a software engineer, I'm working with a healthcare company as a senior full-time developer on Firebase system. I believe that Firebase application will replace all the current apps in the market. Fire will reduce the amount of effort for patient to retrieve their own information and integrate it with any system in the world based on Fire. As you know, the US government now adopt FHIR as a standard to provide a secure exchange and access for electronic health information in the US. And also, we have another use case or a potential market for immigrants and refugees. These people coming from countries that they don't have any central system for patient profiling. So, these kind of apps will help all the insurance company when the people arrive to the new country that they will live on it to have a patient history about these people using fire. My future work currently I'm working with one of my friend's brother who have diabetes type 1 and we are trying to improve the app and adding more feature. I know there is no application perfect but we are trying to improve the journey for the patient. I want to invest more time in this project and I need help from other developers and from patients. This is a one use case. Imagine how many use cases we can create application for helping patients using Fire and implementing the same feature inside this application. One of my goals is creating a community for developers to creating this kind of application and creating a core team to create this application. I want to say thank you for Firely and Fire Foundation and also thank you for the sponsor Microsoft and in the end I want to say something. Civilization started from fire and I believe healthcare will start it again from fire. Thank you everyone. You are of course very lucky that uh, that the fire community welcomes all puns. So I th thank you very much. Uh, the questions from the judges uh, have to do with how far you've gotten in developing this application. Are you looking for help in developing the app or the fire connectors? Are you currently working with any providers to send them the data using fire? 
Okay, sorry, Dave. No, again, the question. So, how far have you gotten in developing this app? Have you okay? Uh, and are you are you you ask for help? Are you looking for people to help with the code or with developing the fire connectors? And have you are you actually sending data to healthcare institutions using fire now? Mm -hmm. So now the application, uh, I already made the application, the application is ready and ready for work, uh, ready actually to, to, to be launched. I actually used it before fire. The, the main thing that I did that I added uh, the fire feature. So fire uh, for developers in general, we have this standard resources. So I only created the uh, resources inside the application. So I'm not connecting this application with any institution now. I'm trying the main idea that I, I highlighted in the presentation, I'm trying to create a, like a small community for creating such as applications. Applications sure. that can not relate it to any institution or can relate it to an institution, but also there is like a term or some stuff for the privacy it, it can be like considered but the main idea is creating these applications that can be related on the data itself so the data in on the device itself and you can download it using fire yeah. resources good and i want to point out to the audience that all four of our finalists are on the zulip chat uh, and in particular look for us on the patient empowerment stream to ask further questions. We've had some really robust discussion already from Morgan Gleason's and Olivier's uh, posts yesterday. So thank you very much, Hamza. And by returning and just one final reminder, if you haven't received it yet, you will be getting an email later today for the People's Choice Award and you'll be able to vote in that poll. And the winners will be announced at the same time the judge's decision will be announced uh, in the closing session tomorrow. Okay, that's it. We're finished and I'll hand it back to you. All right, thank you, Dave. And thank you, Hamza, uh, Bray and Sarah for, uh, for your insights. Well, it's uh, two to the hour, so let's pack up our stuff and run to the next uh, group of sessions. So uh, this is the start of your Dev Days day number three. Enjoy.